every expectant mother knows that what she eats impacts her baby. And now research shows that is also true for our cows. Maternal consumption of Reassure during late gestation had a positive effect on the in utero calf, setting her up for better health and potentially even higher milk production once she joins the milking string. Learn more at balchemanh.com slash launch and launch your herd for life. Good morning, everyone. My name is Scott Sorrell, and once again, I'll be your moderator today. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the next installment of Alchem's Real Science Lecture Series. Today's Real Science webinar steps out of our typical genre of nutrition and looks more closely at sustainability of the entire ag industry. Dr. Frank Mittlerner from the University of California, Davis, is an industry icon, and today will share his talk, Feeding the People Without Wasting the Planet. Before we get started, let's go through a few housekeeping items. We've taken a screenshot of the attendee interface and you should see something that looks like this on your own computer desktop in the upper right corner. You're listening in using the computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. Please reach out to us via the chat box if you are experiencing any difficulties with your audio or connectivity, and we can give you more specific instructions on how to troubleshoot the problems. You will have the opportunity to submit questions to Dr. Mittlerner by typing your questions into the questions pane on the control panel. You may send your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's webinar. If we do not answer your specific question today, We'll send a follow-up email to today's attendees with answers to all the questions submitted during the webinar. There are several handouts available during today's session, including a copy of the slides and a participa participation certificate to claim your ARPA CEU credits. Both are available in the handout tab on the control panel. These resources will also be available following the webinar at balchemanh.com slash real science. I would now like to introduce Dr. Frank Mittlerner. Frank is a professor and air quality specialist in cooperative extension in the Department of Animal Science at the University of California, Davis, where he started his career in 2002. He also serves as an adjunct professor at Northwest Agriculture and Forestry University in Yangling, China. Frank is an expert for agriculture, ag agricultural air quality and greenhouse gases livestock housing and husbandry, as well as animal welfare. He conducts research and outreach that is directly relevant to the understanding and mitigating air emissions and greenhouse gases from livestock operations, as well as the implications of these emissions for the health and safety of farm workers and neighboring communities. Frank has served as chairman of a global United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization partnership to benchmark the environmental footprint of livestock production. He also serves as a workgroup member on the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology and is a member of the National Academies of Science Institute of Medicine on a framework for assessing the health and environmental and social effects of the food system. He received his MS degree in animal science and agricultural engineering from the University of Leipzig, Germany, and his PhD degree in animal science from Texas Technical uh, University. Dr. Mittlerner, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much, Scott. It is a distinct pleasure for me to uh, be with you here today and uh, talk to you about feeding the planet without wasting it. And uh, I will present to you some information that might come across as dry, but I think it's really important. Uh, this information first on greenhouse gases and how the livestock uh, carbon footprint really looks like. Um, we have learned a lot of um, pretty interesting info uh, along those lines, uh, some of which you might find very useful. And then uh, I will talk to you about the 2050 challenge, which is how do we satisfy global increase in demand for animal source foods 
uh, without really impacting our natural resources too much. So without that, without further ado, I will now start. Um, <clears throat> this slide here is just to remind me that we produced a video that is available to you. It's called Rethinking Methane. And the link for this video will be made available to you throughout this webinar. Uh, it's on YouTube. Rethinking Methane is a quite a popular one. It's only five minutes, but it pretty much tells you in a succinct way all the stuff that I'm going over today. <clears throat> hmm, that's interesting. There we go. So um, I start out with this slide here, uh, just to give you an idea of um, greenhouse gases globally and how many there are and what the contribution of the United States is. So imagine this whole pie here being all greenhouse gases associated with human activity worldwide. The total number for this is quite high, 49 gigatons. 49 giga, almost 50 gigatons, that's a lot of greenhouse gases that are produced globally. Of these 49 gigatons, uh, the United States is responsible for 12. So 12 of the 49, 12% of the 49 gigatons are caused by the United States. And if you now look at these three colored uh, pie pieces here, you see the blue one, and that's really the, the lion's share of US contribution to global greenhouse gases. That's caused by US fossil fuels. So that's transportation, power production, cement industry, and so on. That's the blue one. And then these two small ones, this is the carbon footprint of our food production in the United States and its global contribution to greenhouse gases. You can see here, this gray uh, slice here, that's the impact of plant-based foods. And then in, in pink here, the impact of animal source foods produced and consumed in the United States to global greenhouse gases. So approximately half of 1% of all greenhouse gases in the world are a result of the animal source foods that we produce and consume in the United States. Just to give you this general broad overview, because I know that uh, sometimes in the public, uh, in media and so on, uh, the notion is out there that what we eat here has a tremendous impact on global climate and so forth. And uh, this just gives you another perspective. The data here, by the way, are from the US EPA. The next slide shows more specifically uh, what the EPA says uh, are the main sectors of greenhouse gas emissions, that stands for you know, GHG, greenhouse gases. Um, <clears throat> the EPA says that 28% of all greenhouse gases in the United States are associated with cars, trucks, trains, planes, ships, 28%. So let's call that you know, close to a third. Then uh, another 28% are power production and use. Then the industry is 22%, and that's mainly the cement industry, by the way. These three combined, transportation, power production and use, and industry amount to 80, over 80% 80 of greenhouse gases. And these sectors mainly emit CO2, carbon dioxide. Okay, so they are fossil fuel using, meaning they need oil, coal, and gas, or oil, coal, and or gas, and they burn that gas uh, or these fuels, and by doing so, they put CO2 into the air. But the reason why we're here today is to talk about agriculture. And this is not animal agriculture. They, the EPA uses a cow to depict agriculture. But this is really animal and plant agriculture combined, emitting a total of 9% of all greenhouse gases. The EPA says that all animal agriculture emits about 4%. So that's part of that nine here. All, uh, all animal agriculture is 4%. And the most important greenhouse gas from animal agriculture is methane. And here is where there is really a change in our view of the contribution animal agriculture has on climate. And I'll walk you through that very carefully, and I hope that it makes sense. First of all, how are the different greenhouse gases, such as CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide, how are they currently characterized? How, how are they currently quantified? They are currently quantified by using the so-called GWP, global warming potential, assuming that one molecule of methane is 28 times more heat trapping than a molecule of CO2. 
and one molecule of nitrous oxide is 265 times more potent than CO2. I like to use an analogy in class when I teach my 20-year-olds or 21-year-olds, they're now allowed to drink, um, of drinking different beverages. You know, drinking a Coca-Cola versus drinking a beer, a glass of wine, a glass of vodka, all the same volume. We all know that they will have different impacts, different potencies in giving you a buzz. Now, these greenhouse gases also have differences in potency, but obviously not in giving us a buzz, but in um, trapping the heat from the sun. Imagine the sun always radiating solar beams to the surface of the Earth. Normally, that solar radiation would be reflected back into space if there weren't these greenhouse gases. These greenhouse gases effectively form a blanket over our atmosphere, keeping the heat from the sun close to our Earth's surface, just like a blanket would that you put over your body uh, on a cold or a cool summer evening, um, keeping your body temperature close to your body. Okay, So that's what greenhouse gases do. They trap the heat and keep it in our atmosphere. And this is really important for life on Earth. Without these greenhouse gases, we couldn't live here. It would be way too cold. The problem, however, is the blanket is now getting too thick because we have too many greenhouse gases. And then the question arises, how can we reduce those? Because there are international agreements now to limit global warming, uh, people call it more climate change these days, to limit an increase in the global temperatures by less than one and a half degrees centigrade. So, but for now, remember that these greenhouse gases are generally compared by so-called global warming potentials, GWP. And that assumes that the only difference across these gases is the potency to trap heat. And as you will see in a minute, that's not the case. I will focus my next couple of minutes of presentation on methane and CO2. First, methane. This here is the global methane budget. It shows on the left side different emissions of methane, so different sources of methane, including fossil fuel production and use, agriculture and waste, biomass burning, wetlands, and so on. All of these combined, all of these sources of methane combined, emit a total of 558, let's call it 560 teragrams of methane per year, globally, 560 teragrams. And this is where most critics of animal agriculture uh, stop. They just say, you know, there are so many, uh, there's so much methane emitted every year, uh, and methane is so potent, we need to stop everything that causes methane. They're not letting the people know, the public know, that they are not just sources of methane, but there are also sinks of methane. And if you look at the magnitude of this, it's pretty staggering. The total sinks globally amount to 500, almost 550 teragrams per year, meaning there are sources of 560 teragrams putting methane into the air, but then there are sinks reducing methane by 550 teragrams. In other words, the net emissions per year are not 560, but the net emissions are 10, 10. And this is not disputed, in, in, by the way. It's not that there's a controversy over this. It's just not reported in the, in the media. The scientific community will not argue over what I just presented to you. It's well known that methane is not just produced, but methane is also destroyed. And now if you look at this really large arrow facing down here, and it says sink from chemical reactions in the atmosphere, then what does that mean? What it means is that when a methane molecule is in the air, sooner or later it meets a so-called radical. It's called a hydroxyl radical. And that radical destroys the methane. It takes the hydrogen away from the methane and converts the methane back into CO2. It's really important, okay? It's called oxidation. It's a process by which methane is destroyed. And that very process is responsible for what I'm showing you on this slide, namely that there are differences in the lifespan of these gases. There are long-lived climate pollutants such as CO2 and nitrous oxide, and they live a long time. So, for example, if you drive your car, you drive to work, let's say, you will put out CO2 through the tailpipe of your car, and that CO2 will stay in the air for a long time. 
most think about a thousand years. Okay, so every time you have ever driven your car, you have put out CO2 into the atmosphere, and that CO2 is still there. It's not gone; it's still there. CO2 accumulates in the atmosphere. CO2 and nitrous oxide as well, by the way, they accumulate in the atmosphere. Every time we produce these gases, we add more additional gas to an existing stock of that gas. Okay, it's called accumulating or accumulating. Methane is different. Methane is a short-lived climate pollutant because it's not just produced but also destroyed by this oxidation process I talked about earlier. And that is where methane has a lifespan of only 10 years. Only 10 years, very important. And now I will lead you through why methane is so different, particularly with so-called biogenic methane, is so different from, let's say, fossil uh, carbon sources. If you look at methane, methane is CH4. Have you ever asked yourself where that carbon, that C, from the CH4 that a cow belches or that her manure produces, where that carbon comes from and where it ends? I will lead you through it. We start with plants. What do we know about, what do we know about plants and what plants need to, to grow? We, need, we know that they need uh, sunlight, they need water, and they need carbon. The carbon they pull from the air in form of CO2. That's where the carbon comes from that plants need to grow. And that carbon in the form of CO2 is then converted into carbohydrates such as cellulose or starch. Sooner or later, a cow comes along, eats those carbohydrates, eats those plants, and a portion of that carbon contained in the plants is then converted into methane. Before I go there, the unique feature of ruminant animal is that they are capable of eating cellulose, which is the number one most abundant biomass on Earth. The number, number one most abundant biomass on Earth is cellulose, and the only animals that can really um, convert that cellulose into animal source foods are ruminant animals. They upcycle that cellulose and make it into animal source foods. It's a miracle, really. And it's solar powered, by the way. What a beautiful thing. So let me go back to this biogenic carbon cycle. So CO2 carbon goes into plants, produces carbohydrates. The cow eats it and produces methane. She belches it out or her manure produces it. That methane then stays in the atmosphere for approximately 10 years, during which this process called hydroxyl oxidation occurs. And it's called hydroxyl oxidation because what causes that are hydroxyl radicals. These hydroxyl radicals destroy methane and convert it back into CO2. And that CO2 is then in the atmosphere, in the pool of, of, of CO2 in the atmosphere, some of which will be pulled back into plants during photosynthesis. In other words, this carbon here in the form of methane is not new carbon, it is recycled carbon. This carbon here in the form of methane, originated in the form of CO2 from the atmosphere. It is recycled carbon. What's coming now is really important. <clears throat> if you do not grow herds, if you don't add additional livestock to our existing herds, but if our livestock herds were to remain constant, then the amount of methane produced by those animals and the amount of methane destroyed via hydroxyl oxidation, would balance each other out. Constant livestock herds mean constant methane and not increasing methane. And constant methane means constant warming, no increasing warming. Increasing herds would mean new additional carbon, <clears throat> new additional methane, and that would be bad. That would be a problem because don't think that anything I say here means methane doesn't matter. We don't want to produce new additional methane. We want to keep it constant or we want to decrease it. Okay, that's really important. But what's really important on this slide here is that the carbon in the form of methane is not new additional carbon. It is new additional when it comes to fossil fuels, as you will see in a minute. 
So the biogenic carbon cycle is one you should remember, okay, where carbon is recycled from the atmosphere to plants to methane, and then the atmosphere to plants to methane again. This slide here shows on the top panel the beef and on the bottom panel the dairy inventory from 1867 until today. So you see that on the beef side, beef herds went up all the way to 1974. That's when they peaked with about 140 million cattle. Today they are down to around 95 million cattle. So um, at the peak here, we had about 50 million more cattle, beef cattle, than we do today. So over the last 50 years, we decreased our cattle herd quite drastically. So we're not even holding it stable, we are decreasing our beef herd. And we have been doing that for five, five decades. On the dairy side, you see that the peak was in 1950 something, when we had 25 million dairy cows, 25. Today we have 9 million dairy cows. We went from 25 to now 9, but with this much smaller herd today, we are producing 60% more milk, 6-0. We have reduced the carbon footprint between the height and, and, and today. We have reduced the carbon footprint of a glass of milk by two-thirds during that time. By the way, on the beef side, uh, while we have 50 million fewer cattle today than we did in 1970, we are producing the same amount of beef today. Back on the dairy side, the last time we had 9 million dairy cows was in 1867, a time when we had 30 million people in this country, and today we have 10 times that many. It's truly remarkable what we have done in this country, both on the beef and on the dairy side. Of course, I could talk about other livestock species too, but um, that's uh, for another talk. So on the fossil fuel side, things are very differently. So what are fossil fuels? Fossil fuels are plant and animal material that uh, died and uh, decayed and fossilized a long, long time ago. And then it accumulates, accumulated deep in the earth. You see those black areas here and they, these uh, fossil fuel reserves were then extracted on the ocean or on land. We are pulling the stuff out of the earth and we are burning it. And when we are burning it, we net accumulate that carbon in the atmosphere. So while the biogenic carbon cycle is one where we recycle, where we recycle carbon, where it goes around and around, the fossil fuel carbon goes one way and that's from the bottom up. And this is, ladies and gentlemen, where we add as humankind significant carbon to the atmosphere through the use of fossil fuels. And most climate scientists will tell you that the 800 pound gorilla of human contributions to climate change, that this 800 pound gorilla is the use of fossil fuels. Again, here in the United States, it's at least 80%, 80, in most developed countries it is. And, um, but our, our critics, particularly those in animal agriculture say, nah, it's what you eat that matters, okay? We need to change what we eat in order to make a big difference on our climate. And that's what I have a beef with. Here you see a slide, it's not a new slide, it's from 2007, but the trend is what matters. The bottom panel here shows what happened between 1750, 1750, and pretty much today, namely that uh, around in 1950, we started to really heavily extracting fossil fuels. We burned that stuff, um, and we are now at approximately a peak oil situation, meaning we have almost taken half of the fossil fuel that was stored in the ground for a long, long time out of the ground. And therefore we have taken that carbon that was down there, we've put it into the atmosphere. Every time the sun hits it, those carbon molecules heat up. This here is the same depiction of what I just described. Um, on the right side here, you see the, the biogenic carbon cycle uh, of livestock, uh, where carbon really goes around and around and around. On my earlier slide, I didn't even touch on, on the soil, even though the soil is hugely important. So you can see the, the biogenic carbon cycle is even more complex than we, what we talked about before. Um, and contrast that, that biogenic carbon cycle of recycling carbon uh, through our biosphere. Uh, compare that to fossil fuels where you have a carbon locked down in the ground. We are unlocking it by extracting it and we are burning it. And by doing so, we're put, putting ancient carbon uh, that was down there to the atmosphere 
uh, and we do this every day, day in, day out. So remember, fossil versus biogenic carbon are very different. And this is the reason why any comparison of cars versus cows is fundamentally flawed and should never be made. Fundamentally flawed and should never be made. I will now get a little technical, okay? Um, but it is really important that you understand the differences between and across different greenhouse gases, uh, namely between the gas CO2 and the gas methane, because methane is the Achilles heel of animal agriculture right now. It is all about methane. When people compare a plant-based burger to a beef burger, the reason why the plant-based burger looks so good is because of methane. So pay attention now. This slide here shows in the bottom, in the top top panel here, um, CO2, it's a so-called stock gas. Okay, why is it called a stock gas? So let's say you were to drive to work from Monday through Friday, okay? And day one is Monday. So on day one, you drive to work and you put out CO2 with your car. On day two, you drive to work again and you put in, you put new CO2 into the atmosphere that's now on top of what you put in on Monday. So what you put on out on Monday is still there, of course. On Wednesday, you do the same thing again. You drive to work again, you add new additional CO2 to the atmosphere, and that's now present in addition to the Tuesday and the Monday amount, and so on and so on. You get the, you get the gist of it, uh, that stock gases accumulate over time, okay? They stay in the atmosphere, they stay in the environment. And every time you produce that gas, you add to the existing stock that's already there. Methane is very different. Methane is a so-called flow gas, and it is produced and destroyed at almost equal rate. So what you see here is uh, that if you produce methane in one year uh, and in the next year and the following year, you're not really adding additional methane to the atmosphere unless you increase, let's say, herd size, okay? If we were to go from 90 million beef cattle to 120 million beef cattle, then we would add new additional methane to the atmosphere. But if we keep it at 90 million, then we are not adding new additional methane and hence not new additional warming to the atmosphere. Remember what I just showed you about herd sizes in the United States. For the last five or so decades, we have not done anything to increase herd size. We have decreased them. And what that means to our warming, to our Earth's warming, is what I will show you in a minute. So please remember, flow gases will stay stagnant because they are destroyed at the same rate as they are emitted. Okay. So there's a big difference between a stock gas, like CO2, and a flow gas, such as methane. Why do I tell you all of that? I tell you all of that because this so-called GWP, this global warming potential that I talked about earlier, assumes that all greenhouse gases behave the same way as CO2, namely that they all accumulate in the atmosphere. But methane doesn't. And that is why methane should not be characterized using this GWP method. But that's the way it currently is assessed, using this GWP method. Here are a couple of papers <clears throat> for your leisure, if you so wish, and to, to learn more about this. <clears throat> you'll find uh, some, uh, some papers here that are more block type, uh, but then there are many peer-reviewed papers, uh, but they are written so, in a, such a technical way that it will make most people's head spin. Um, there is now very strong evidence that the way we have been characterizing methane by simply using the so-called GWP is indeed flawed. And it puts a black eye to animal agriculture that animal agriculture does not deserve. And I will show to you in a minute what I mean, why I think we need to rethink methane in a major way. Here are three scenarios I'll walk you through. And I will tell you what these three scenarios do when you use the current GWP method of characterizing them versus a new way of characterizing them that is much more scientifically valid and accurate. Three scenarios, three methane scenarios I will go through. The first one is a scenario by which methane emissions rise, increase over 30 years by 35%. So imagine, for example, we grow our cattle herds, okay, by significantly so that we produce 35% more methane over 30 years. Second scenario is one where methane is pretty much stable, maybe a small, a slight fall of methane over 30 years. 
And the third scenario will be one by which we decrease methane strongly by 35%. So again, an increase by 35% stable and then a decreasing 35% of methane. What would that do if we were to characterize these three scenarios with a global warming potential assessment? The global warming potential assessment results in what's called CO2 equivalents because we convert everything to its equivalent amount of CO2. All three scenarios, the increasing the stable and the decreasing methane scenario would result in a strong warming impact of these three scenarios uh, with respect to CO2 equivalents. And even if we decrease methane, it would still predict that we are strongly increasing the carbon footprint um, of that source, let's say a kettle herd. What happens in reality is this, and it's characterized much better by what's called global warming potential, GWP, global warming potential star. And GWP star would predict the following, that if you increase methane by 35%, you indeed um, add additional warming to the atmosphere. And we don't want to do that, okay? I want to be very clear about that. None of what I'm saying here is a get free out of jail card or a creative accounting method or something, but this is really characterizing using an appropriate scientific method, the actual warming impact of methane. So if we increase methane by 35%, we increase warming pretty sharply. But look what happens when we keep methane pretty stable or slightly decrease it. If we keep methane stable, or slightly decrease it, then we will not add any new additional warming to the atmosphere, but we might even have a slight cooling effect. And now what really excites me is this. Imagine decreasing methane by 35%. What happens then is that we have a strong negative warming. And negative warming is a fancy word for cooling. A decrease in methane emissions from our livestock herds would mean that we would have a cooling effect to our atmosphere. And that, I think, is very exciting because it actually shows us a path for a solution to this whole issue. And in fact, a path to climate neutrality of animal agriculture. A path to climate neutrality of animal agriculture. The next slide is also quite technical, but again, it's very important. The first one here is a scenario in which two gases, CO2 and methane, both increase. So let's say the CO2 were produced by a power plant, the methane by a cattle herd. Both of them are growing uh, and therefore emissions related to those are increasing. What happens when these emissions are increasing with respect to warming is depicted in the bottom part of this panel. Increasing CO2 leads to an exponentially increasing amount of warming because remember CO2 is cumulative, okay? So what you put out today is in addition to what you put out yesterday. That's why the warming increases exponentially. The warming around increasing methane increases too, but linearly at the same rate as methane increases, the warming will increase. Now let's take a look what happens when you have constant CO2 and constant methane emissions. When you have constant CO2 and constant methane emissions, then the resulting warming for the CO2 will increase still because it's accumulating. But look what happens to methane. Constant amounts of methane produced will lead to a constant amount of warming, meaning no additional warming. Let's say you were to have a dairy farm. And let's say your parents' generation started that farm 50 years ago then only the first 10 years, only the first 10 years, you would have had a warming impact of that methane because you had nothing and then all of a sudden you had 100 cows, that means the methane went up. But then after the first 10 years, after the production and destruction of methane were held in balance, the amount of methane that your constant herd size produced led to constant amounts of methane generated by that herd. No additional methane, but a replacing of old methane with new methane, and that means constant methane. And that constant methane means constant warming. So that means a constant herd of 100 cows over 50 years will not have any contribution to additional warming. But now look what happens when you decrease both CO2 and methane. 
So let's say we turn the power plant off. Okay, we had it on for 50 years, now we turn it off. That means the CO2 now goes down. What happens to warming is that the warming still continues because the CO2 still continues. Uh, as you see here, incrementally, even though it's going down, it's still adding to the previously emitted CO2 and therefore the warming impact. So even if you reduce CO2, you still increase warming for quite some time, and then eventually you will plateau that, that warming impact of decreasing CO2. But look what happens to methane. Your decreasing methane will instantaneously decrease warming, or in other words, decreasing methane will lead to instantaneous cooling effects instantaneous cooling effects. So the question then is, can this be done? Can this be done? Well, in California, we have a new law called SB 1383 that mandates a 40% reduction of methane within the next 10 years. For the last few years, our state, instead of using rules or regulations and fines, decided to go the other route and incentivize techniques, technologies to reduce methane. For example, anaerobic digesters were installed on many dairies, leading to an annual reduction of 2.2 million metric tons of methane per year, per year. That's remarkable, and it amounts to a 25% reduction of methane related uh, of methane uh, in the state of California from our dairy sector. So our dairy sector is supposed to reach 40% reduction. We are over halfway there at 25 of the 40. So we have made remarkable progress. And I want to remind you what a 25% reduction of methane looks like. 25% reduction of methane means that this sector is now contributing to cooling because we are pulling carbon out of the atmosphere by reducing it, by reducing that methane. So I will now uh, switch gears and talk to you about um, the so-called 2050 challenge. It is a very important discussion that many, particularly millennials and Gen Z people, are very, very much interested and concerned about, interested in and concerned about. On the x-axis of this slide, you see the year 1750 to 2050, hence the name 2050 challenge. And it shows the human population development over that period of time. On the z-axis, you see the total human population in billions. So, <clears throat> I'm now 50, and when I was a little boy, we were right here at around 3 billion people. Today, we are here at 7.6 billion, and by the time I'm an old man, we'll be here at 9.5 billion people. Or in other words, throughout my lifetime, human population on our planet will have tripled. We will have three times more people on this planet throughout our lifetimes. But the natural resources to feed these people will not have tripled throughout our lifetimes. If we are lucky, it will have plateaued. Um, and that obviously leads us to make some uh, important decisions around how we grow food. What you see on this slide, um, in addition to just uh, the sheer number increases, are two colors. The developed part of the world is portrayed in orange. And you can see that uh, the Americas, Europe, and so on are plateauing. We're not increasing human population to any major scale, but in the developing and third world countries and emerging countries, human population is going skyrocket high. And that's mainly, by the way, a result of increasing life expectancies. People grow older, and that cumulatively means we have more mouths to feed globally. One of my favorite slides here shows the world in a circle over South Southeast Asia depicting an area that contains more people in it than the rest of the world combined. More people live inside the circle than outside the circle. And I find that truly remarkable. So clearly one of the hotspots of human population development in the years to come. This year is more of the same. It shows the human population increase uh, by 2050 uh, in different regions. You see Southeast Asia and South Asia will increase by 41%, Africa by almost half. The Americas will be pretty stable and Europe will slightly shrink, meaning the 2050 challenge is not one that applies equally throughout the world, but it is one in two main regions, South Southeast Asia and Africa. The rest of the world will not have that issue as much as these two. 
here a uh, graph from a German publication. It shows uh, more specifically how China, Bangladesh, and other countries uh, will develop with respect to human population. You see China will continue to decrease slightly, whereas India, almost the same size as China today, will increase human population quite drastically along with Bangladesh. But look what happens in, in African countries. Here, all of these countries, the mark in red, have a human population increase of over 100%, meaning every 10 years, they're doubling their population. Every 10 years, they're doubling their population. And that is truly remarkable and uh, not sustainable. Mainly in effect, by the way, of, um, of women and girls not having appropriate education and or uh, access to contraception. So many of these countries have uh, five living kids. Of course, some of the kids uh, also had, on average, will, will have deceased, but five on average survive in many of these countries. This year is the global distribution of cropland, and I find it quite remarkable how little land we have in the world to grow crops. I want to show you a quick depiction of why this is a challenge. So imagine this slide, this sheet of paper here being the surface of the earth. I'll go ahead and fold this paper and I will fold it twice until it's approximately the size of a postcard. What you see now is all the land on earth. The rest is water and ice, but this is all the land on earth. And this here is my business card. While this is all the land on earth, this is all agricultural land. So that's all land on earth. This is all agricultural land. I will now fold my business card into one piece that's two thirds and one that's one third. And then I will rip my business card into pieces. So again, this is all agricultural land. And the larger of the two is all marginal agricultural land. That's land that's not suitable to grow crops because the soil quality is not good enough or there's not enough water. What do we use that land for? We largely use it for ruminant livestock. Because ruminant livestock is able to eat that cellulose, grasses and so on that grows there, and upcycles it. And this here, this one third of my business card is all arable land. And that's all the land in the world we have to grow crops. That is how resource limited we are. And those people who say, well, 70% of all agricultural land is used for livestock, these people are not lying. But what they leave out is the fact that this land cannot be used for any other food growing purpose. This slide here is a, an important one that shows on the x-axis uh, the milk output per cow, fat protein corrected milk per cow per year. On the y-axis, the carbon footprint. And each dot here shows one country in the world. So what this slide shows is that there are many countries where dairy cows produce a dismal amount of milk per cow per year. We're talking about a thousand pounds here per cow per year. And as a result, the carbon footprint depicted on the y-axis here is very high in these countries. These cows just have enough food to satisfy their maintenance requirements, but not enough to really produce a sizable chunk of milk. And then you go down here and that, that then leads you to herds that produce relatively larger amounts of milk. And as you can see, there's a direct relationship between productivity on the one hand and the greenhouse gases associated with that productivity. The more efficient you are, the relatively lower is your environmental footprint, in this case, the carbon footprint. The slide here shows on the x-axis different regions in the world. On the y-axis, the carbon footprint of, these, uh, of the dairy sector in these different regions. You can see here, North America has the lowest, certainly not the highest as some media want the, the public to believe. We have the lowest carbon footprint of dairy production in the world. And this, by the way, is not just the U.S., this is also Mexico. If this were just the U.S., we'd be half the column size we are here. You can see here there are three um, that are really standing out, three regions that are standing out with respect to the carbon footprint of dairy production. And these are the same areas that I just showed you on the other map uh, that have the greatest human population increase. This is really the hot spot of food insecurity and environmental um, pressures globally, uh, parts of Africa, most, most parts of Africa and parts of South Asia. So how did we get to where we are in a place like the United States, where 
production efficiency and environmental footprint per unit of pro product has really shrunk to historic levels. We have improved reproduction, we have improved the veterinary sector, and we have improved genetics, along with feeding more energy-dense diets. And we have arrived at record low numbers of animals needed to produce a given amount of food. Never before have we had smaller herds and flocks than we do today. And that is a direct effect of those four factors I just mentioned. In the United States, between 1948 and today, we have kept the farm inputs pretty much stable. But look what happened to the agricultural outputs. We have tripled those. We've done so much more with so much less or with similar uh, inputs over the years. And that is a truly remarkable achievement. I already talked to you about the dairy sector here that we used to have 25 million. Now we have 9 million cows. We're producing 60% today with this much smaller herd. It means the carbon footprint of a glass of milk has shrunk by two thirds. One example, international example, um, most everybody knows that China is not a developing country. They might call themselves an emerging country, but they make your head spin in many regards. They are producing about half of the world's pigs in China. And the numbers I'm now giving you are pre-African swine fever outbreak. Half of the world's pigs um, are produced in China. Uh, that's about 1 billion pigs per year. But guess what? Of the 1 billion, they have pre-weaning mortality of 400 million pigs. 400 million pigs there never make it to market. Truly astounding. In general, 70 to 80% of all greenhouse gases from the livestock sector are uh, occurring in developing countries. Not in developed, but in developing countries. Um, we know that drastic emission reductions are both necessary and feasible. We know that there are technologies and regenerative practices that can get us there. And uh, we also know that production intensity and emission intensity are inversely related, meaning the more productive we are, the relatively lower is the environmental footprint of our livestock herds. That is something you and I might know. It is not something the public understands. And we have to do a much better job communicating that. Now, a few more slides. One of the questions I oftentimes get is, can we eat ourselves out of climate change? Because people claim we can. If you were to be an omnivore right now and you were to plan to go vegan, then that would save you 0 0.8 tons of greenhouse gases per year. So how, is that a lot or is that not a lot? Let's contrast that to one transatlantic flight per passenger. One transatlantic flight per passenger generates 1.6 tons of greenhouse gases. So going vegan for one year would have the same impact as half of one transatlantic flight per passenger. If we as the United States were to go meatless Monday, it would save us 0.3% of greenhouse gases nationwide. If the whole nation were to go vegan, it would save us 2.6% of greenhouse gases nationwide. But the authors uh, who published this in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences cautioned that if we were to go vegan as a nation, we would not be able to satisfy our critical nutritional needs. Now, I have a lot of things to say about veganism. Not that I have a problem with it. They can eat whatever they want. Uh, the problem is they have a problem with what I eat, not I with what they eat. Um, but what I find interesting is this. A simple statistics. For every one active vegan in the United States, for every one active vegan in the United States, there are five former vegans. And that means the retention time for veganism is extremely low. This here is a statistics provided by a large vegan association here in the United States. They say that 84% of all vegetarians and vegans abandon their diet after one year. After one year, 84% of all vegetarians and vegans stop being that way. And if, that, if this were truly such a successful and enticing and intriguing uh, diet, then that wouldn't be uh, happening. So what is missing, whether it's nutrients, whether it's flavor, I don't know, but they're actually having a pretty, pretty big problem. So what's portrayed in the media as this being the new movement, a major deal and so on, I am quite critical of that. If you want to know what the biggest contributor of our food supply and our food system is on environmental issues, it clearly is depicted on this photo here. This is a average US family in front of all the food waste associated with that family. 
40% of all food produced in the United States go to waste, go to landfills, 4-0, 40%. A number not just true for the United States, but for the entire developed world and the developing world. Imagine that even in African countries, 40% of all the food grown there does never make it through the human digestive tract. There though, for other reasons, not because consumers don't want it or don't eat it, but more because they can't get it off the fields on time, on processed on time and so forth. 40% food waste and food loss is a number that holds true globally. And I think we can do better, much better. So with that, I come to a close here. I wanna tell you, um, if you're not on Twitter, you should be. I was convinced to be on Twitter. And so now my job is to convince you. Uh, GHG Guru is my handle. I have about 3 million people or 3 million impressions a month showing that there's a lot of interest in this field. We have good discussions there. Uh, the Clear Center, which I uh, established a year ago, is on Twitter as well. We have established also a blog, which you find here. And uh, we have a web page. And that web page can be found here, clear.ucdavis.edu. Not just do we do research, but we communicate about it. So with that, I thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to any questions you might have. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mitlener. That was uh, quite fascinating. Uh, before we get started answering questions, we'd like to share a brief video, and then we'll be right back to answer questions submitted during today's presentation. Five cents might not seem like much, but when it's five cents for every cow, every day, then it really adds up. New AminoSure XM Precision Release Methionine provides the optimal combination of cost, feed stability, rumen stability, and intestinal release to deliver the best cost per unit of available methionine on the market today. Learn how at balchemanh.com slash findyourx. As a reminder, you can still submit questions through the questions pane in your attendee control panel. Uh, Dr. Mittlerner, uh, I'm gonna ask the first question. I found the uh, uh, information on veganism uh, quite fascinating. Do you have an understanding of, of um, the reasons people become vegans? Is it, that, is it for health reasons? Is it for animal welfare reasons? Or is it uh, concerns over the environment? vegans so we're now not talking about those who just feel you know let's try this out but the people who are really uh, deeply committed are those who feel that we should not use animals for any purpose period uh, they just have a fundamental belief that um, that animals are living beings that have feelings and shouldn't be killed uh, to be eaten by us that's where the vast majority of veganism comes from uh, and uh, in the past, they used uh, that argument, the one I just made, um, to convince uh, followers, and they found that that didn't work. Then they used uh, animal welfare, animal rights, and so on. That didn't work. Uh, and then they went down the path of climate, and that worked. So um, now people say, well, I want to do my thing for the environment, so what do I do? They read the newspaper, and they find in the newspaper that what you eat has a huge impact on your climate, on the climate, which I hope I was able to convince you of is not the case. Uh, it's not that what you eat has no impact on climate, it does, but it's dwarfed by the, the use of fossil fuel that we are all responsible for. Um, and so I think animal agriculture has for the longest time done a bad job a bad job in explaining what their true contributions are because we know what they are and belittling the discussion and saying you know we don't believe in this and leave us alone with that and so on and i think that was a drastic mistake and one that that people now have to pay for um, and it needs to change we know what the contributions are we know what we can do to further reduce our impact um, and we have to tell a story because that story is really good 
All right, very well. Our next question comes from Brandon. If a ruminant is able to convert CO2 into animal slash usable product, how is it not a net negative CO2 usage when ruminants graze? Um, that is because that methane that they produce will be in the atmosphere for about 10 years. And while it is in the atmosphere, it is heat trapping. So uh, while it's true that the carbon that goes through the biogenic carbon cycle is recycled carbon and not adding new additional carbon to the atmosphere, uh, it is also true that while that methane is out there, it is heat trapping. And so that is why, um, that is, that's the reason why. Uh, in general, if you have a constant cattle herd, you are not adding new additional carbon to the atmosphere, hence you're not adding additional water to the atmosphere. And that is a sea, ch sea change uh, in the narrative uh, that we are hearing, because everybody currently assumes that methane behaves the same way as CO2, that it's cumulative, which it's not. All right, thank you. The next question comes from Robert. Are there any technologies to reduce methane production in ruminants? Oh, absolutely, yes. There are many technologies, um, some around their manure, uh, such as anaerobic digesters, um, special screening methods uh, for the manure, uh, for example, weeping walls and so forth. Um, but there are also feed additives, <clears throat> including tannins, including essential oils, including Enzyme inhibitors, such as 3-NOP, a product produced by a European company, VSM. Um, and uh, the research that we have done here at UC Davis uh, has established reduction potential of the enteric emissions alone, meaning the belching, of anywhere between 10 to 40 percent, some even higher. So I do believe, while currently most of these products are not commercially available, there will be, and it takes about five years, and there will be a significant market of that I'm certain as well. All right, uh, we have a series of questions here, one building on the other, kind of this came in from Bradley. Uh, we have a debate in this country drawing along political lines about whether or not global warming is real. Where do you stand on the issue? Are humans responsible for global warming? Have we passed the point of no return? And can we reverse course, and if so, how? Yeah, I'm, I'm not so sure that it's true that it's a discussion around or along political lines. I think that, for example, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a frequent speaker at, at uh, all different kinds of meetings, and I talk to thousands of, of uh, farmers and farming agricultural people and so on. And yes, originally most of them were critical, but, um, but I would say that the majority of them now feel that things are changing, that we are seeing longer droughts, we are seeing you know, immense fires, we are seeing storms that are quite unprecedented and so on. And um, especially the older, the older ones among us, um, they say, wow, you know, there are, there are things that are really different now than the way they were. And uh, most climate scientists, and I'm not a climate scientist, I'm an animal scientist, but most climate scientists will tell you that, um, that the climate indeed is changing and uh, that it will continue to change. And I believe it is changing. Um, so to me, as an animal scientist, the most important question is um, if there seems to be, and there, there does seem to be a consensus that greenhouse gases drive climate change um, and animal agriculture has a contribution to the release of greenhouse gases, then instead of us um, fighting and saying, no, it's not true and leave us alone with that, um, we need to be at the table and we need to say, um, we understand that we are producing greenhouse gases such as methane. We have learned what the true impacts are. Here's what they are. We have quantified them for dairy, for beef, for swine, and so on. And we have made commitments for further reductions. We have done our bit. Is this important to do? It's critically important to do because the people who buy your products, such as McDonald's, Burger King, Walmart, Sam's Club, and so on, they will tell you, as long as you do not know what your industry contributes, and if you don't have further reduction goals, we'll not buy your product, period. I think it is a question of the sustainability of your industry, of knowing what your contributions are, 
um, knowing what you can do to further reduce and having serious pledges. So I, I, I think that this is really critically important for animal agriculture today to know what your contributions are and further reduce. All right, thank you for that. The next question comes from Joan. Uh, what happens to the predictions uh, when you factor in that cows produce methane and carbon dioxide? What is the impact of increasing global ruminant herds then? The carbon dioxide from ruminant livestock doesn't really matter because it's a net wash. And the reason why it's a net wash is the same that your respiration is not counted. The reason why the CO2 that you are expiring right now is not counted is because it's a result of the plants, the carbon that you are respiring right now was previously sucked up by plants during photosynthesis. You then ate those plants and released that same carbon again. It's a net wash, okay? What plants sucked out of the air, you are now putting back into the air. So the same is true for, for ruminant livestock, okay? The, the CO2 that they respire uh, was previously um, assimilated by plants that they ate, so it's not counted. Um, overall, what we don't want to see is increasing livestock herds uh, nationwide or globally, and I think we can prevent those. We don't need global increasing herd sizes. What we need is a revolution in efficiency of livestock herds, particularly in the developing world. A country like India, for example, has 300 million, 300 million dairy animals, both cows and buffaloes, 300 million. We have nine. They could produce the same amount of milk that they produce currently with a herd one sixth of their size. The reason why they need so many is because these animals are so inefficient. So we don't need to grow herd sizes, not even globally. We can shrink them and still produce more product pretty easily. All right. Uh, the next question comes from Tom. What is the difference in methane emission from a 600 kg dairy cow versus an 800 kg dairy cow? In general, um, the 800 kg dairy cow will be most likely will be larger, will have a higher metabolism, will eat more and so on. But um, overall, per unit of milk produced will have a lower carbon footprint because if you have a herd of the higher producing cows uh, and you were to replace that with a herd with lower uh, producing cows, then the lower producing cows would have a relatively higher amount of nutrients going to maintenance compared to the higher producing cow and uh, cow herd. And so in general, production efficiency and emissions are directly, directly correlated. The more efficient you are, the relatively lower are your emissions. All right, and our next question comes from Eric. If every beef and dairy animal in the US were to be fed uh, three NOP or other such equivalent options, what total qualified impact would that have on methane? What have other countries realized that are able to use those technologies? So I think in the US, the, uh, I would say California is the first adopter right now, uh, as so often. Um, we want to have a 40% reduction of methane and we will achieve that until 2030. And um, feed additives will play an important role. If we were to feed the entire US dairy and beef herd with some kind of uh, feed additive, uh, such as Agolin or 3NOP or uh, Mutro or some of the others that have shown to have effects, um, we could reduce the largest part of methane from livestock, which is enteric emissions, by anywhere between 10 to 40 percent. So, and on top of that, we have the ability to reduce the manure methane emissions. Uh, here in California, we are mainly doing this via anaerobic digestion, uh, where we take the manure put it in a digester, but then we don't burn it, making it to power. Instead, we use the biogas from the digester and make it into what's called renewable natural gas, RNG. And that RNG is then going into vehicle fleets, such as semi-trucks, to replace diesel. If you were to use that technology of going from biomass to RNG to 
diesel replacement, you would get incredible, incredible credits from the state of California, uh, very worth your investment. There's a new gold rush going on in the state right now in doing what I just said. Long answer, I'm sorry, but um, these are important nuances. Very well. Uh, Lataro would uh, like to ask, um, what happens to the carbon that results from methane oxidation? How is that accounted into the calculation of stock carbon accumulations? So <clears throat> when methane oxidizes, it produces uh, CO2 and water. And that CO2 goes back into the atmospheric pool of CO2. Um, and while that happens, of course, the plants then suck CO2 out of that atmospheric pool again. So if you do the math, uh, the mass balance, let's say, um, let's say uh, the plants uh, in a certain given uh, location suck 100 units of CO2 out of the air. That goes into, some of that stays in the ground, some of it stays uh, in the roots, some of that becomes above ground carbon, uh, you know, cellulose or starch. The animals that eat that and a certain fraction of that carbon then becomes methane. It's much smaller, of course, than what the plant sucked out of the air. And that becomes methane. And after 10 years, that carbon in the methane then becomes CO2 again and joins the general pool of CO2. Overall, um, overall, there's no additional carbon in the system. It's all recycled. All right. Uh, the next comment comes from John, and he says, excellent presentation. Do you have any comment on the efficiency of the modern poultry meat sector and its contribution to global warming? The poultry sector is, uh, just like the pork sector, better, better off because uh, both poultry and pork are quite efficient in converting uh, feed into product, but that's human edible feed, by the way, and that's soy and corn and so on. <clears throat> so they're very efficient that way, um, but they can't really use as much, um, or they, they have to use more human edible uh, feedstuff, whereas livestock, uh, ruminant livestock eats more non-human edible feedstuff. <clears throat> so how about the methane? Um, poultry and, and pigs, uh, of course, don't belch, and so the enteric emission portion plays no role. It's all manure. Uh, it's then a question of what do you do with the manure? If the poultry and pig industry <clears throat> were to use the technology I, I referred to earlier, which is take the manure, put it into digesters, anaerobic digesters, and then convert that, convert that energy into RNG, renewable natural gas, I think that would be a huge game changer game changer for both of these industries. And I think that's my my uh, view in the crystal ball. I think that's exactly where things will go. I think in the years to come, open lagoons will be a thing of the past. Um, open lagoons will not be tolerated in many parts of the country and the world because they emit gases that people object to, nuisances, uh, they attract flies and so on. But also, they are really an untapped resource. We can do much more with them than just land applying them as fertilizer. And I think that will happen. All right, uh, staying in the poultry industry, have we done any research in laying hens and interested in your thoughts on the impact as we move toward cage-free? Uh, that's a broad question. Uh, any research into laying hens with respect to greenhouse gases or with respect to sustainability or you might not know that Scott um, <clears throat> as to what the what the person meant uh, but in general have we done research on sustainability for laying hands the answer is yes in fact I was part of a very large project called the um, coalition for sustainable egg supply CSES um, and the coalition for sustainable egg supply did a very large study on sustainability including environmental impacts, animal welfare and health, food safety, worker issues, and financial viability of battery cage systems versus enriched cage systems versus free range systems. Um, all of the CSES 
work was published. It's in the peer-reviewed literature. If you Google CSES, you will find that. <clears throat> and uh, the findings were, in my opinion, mainly uh, along the lines that the least sustainable system, the least sustainable system, is the one of free range. And the reason for that is that animals engage in behaviors that are quite uh, negative and uh, that inflict pain and suffering in their peers. Uh, for example, they can fly and when they land, they land on one of their peers and break the bones and so on. So uh, lots of issues there. Way too much, way too, too detailed um, a study to discuss in a few minutes. But CSES is uh, what well, you should look up the coalition for sustainable egg supply and it's all there it's all published all right and then uh we'll end with this and we've uh, we've had many many questions we're not going to be able to get to them all today just a reminder that we will be uh answering those questions and uh, posting them to our website uh but we'll end with this one that the dairy industry is currently conducting genetic research to create dairy cows that release less methane could it be possible to eventually develop cows that are net negative methane producers? Net negative? No, that's not possible. But um, what is possible is that we will get to a point, and the point is in the near future, where our dairy sector will become climate neutral. Mark my words, we will soon enter an age where our dairy industry will become climate neutral. And what I mean by that is the methane will continue to go down. And I saw, I showed to you what that does to climate, what it does to temperatures, namely it has a cooling effect. And that cooling effect on the methane side will offset the nitrous oxide and CO2 on the other side. I expect within the next 10 years that the California dairy industry will be climate neutral, not carbon neutral, climate neutral. And that's what we're really after, that our livestock industries do not affect the climate in a negative way. And that is the path we are on. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Mitlerner. And thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. If you have additional questions, please submit them to anh.marketing at balchem.com and we'll forward them to you along with the unanswered questions from today's session. In the next few weeks, Balchem will launch an extension of the Real Science Lecture Series in podcast form. But this won't just be any boring podcast. You'll get to know top researchers like you've never known them before. Go behind the scenes and hear the conversations that take place over a few drinks with friends. Join us at the Real Science Tap Room as we discuss the hot topics in the dairy industry and share a range of new ideas. Watch for links in your email and be sure to follow us on your favorite podcast platform. The next Real Science Lecture Series webinar will be on October 6th. As requested by several of you uh, attendees here, um, Dr. Adam Locke from Michigan State University will delve into the science of fatty acid nutrition. Visit balchemanh.com slash real science for more details and to register. On behalf of Balchem and Dr. Mitlerner, thank you for joining us today.